you can always say with some fiat number okay sure it eventually reach that but is a bitcoin going to be worth more than 10,000 acres of land bitcoin is already a success it's kind of amazing to see so much of traditional finance coming over there's 8 billion people but there's going to be 100 billion robots running around they're going to spend bitcoin right they're not going to be spending gold coins or or you know whatever fiat currency then you could make a case that there's there's an even bigger market that doesn't exist yet there's been a huge drop off in the number of articles saying that bitcoin is bad for the environment for example since then i percent for a massive massive fund is a lot more than just a couple of regular people saying oh yeah i want to put 50 percent of my money into that and the rebalancing effect means that if you have bitcoin down then they're going to buy more bitcoin and if bitcoin goes way up they're actually going to be selling some bitcoin to get back down to that target level this has a stabilizing effect actually and it could result in a longer sustained rally if you completely stopped updating the code base bitcoin would eventually start falling apart will bitcoin be a multi-planetary uh, currency one day What was some of your highlights? What were some of the, the things that you have been witnessing the last like couple of months in the Bitcoin scene that was uh, not worth it for you? I mean, there's there's a lot. I <clears throat> First off, I got to see uh, Baltic Honey Badger in Riga. Uh, there was a conference that was on my list for a long time. And uh, it's always nice to go to the, the small, serious conferences where you have Bitcoiners who really are building amazing things um, for other Bitcoiners. And uh, then you also get to uh, hang out with some of those excellent Bitcoiners as well without having to be a VIP. <laughs> yeah, definitely. They are yeah. really, really cool. And what of, what about like the, the things that happened in Bitcoin? I mean, the, like Bitcoin ETF happened, the, the halving I think happened in between and so many yeah. other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's some, as they say, there, there are weeks when decades happen, right? And it's been, it's been pretty crazy. Uh, um, cer certainly, with the way uh, you know Bitcoin Twitter works, people can only remember the, the last one or two things that happened. And it's like, oh, right, we actually had the entire launch of the spot ETF um, <clears throat> because every, every ETF, you know, for Bit spot ETF for Bitcoin had been denied. But then almost every single ETF that BlackRock had applied for had been approved. So then it's like, what happens when these two meet? Yeah, they, they got what they wanted. And uh, I think most Bitcoiners also got what they wanted here because this is what just allows so much more money to flow in. The existing products were, were not quite right. The futures ETFs didn't track very well and had much higher expenses. The <clears throat> GBTC fund had very high expenses, you know, went to huge premiums and discounts. And... Uh, it's great to finally have a, a real product for for institutions or for people who are not going to be doing their own custody. Um, and I think we've, we've seen a pretty huge effect already from that, <clears throat> simply that so much so much more um, so much more money and more interest and legitimacy has come in. Um, there's been a huge drop off in the number of articles saying that Bitcoin is bad for the environment, for example, since then. Um, so that's, there's definitely a, t a change in tone. And actually, most recently, um, the SEC approved options on the uh, spot <clears throat> Bitcoin ETFs, which, again, there's, there's some Bitcoiners that they don't, they don't really understand why that, that's important or they think it's just gambling or so on. But um, options and other derivatives are actually very useful tools for the people that need them in, in terms of um, hedging their exposure uh, and just in terms of even um, measuring the volatility of the markets accurately. Um, and that helps bring in a lot more, a lot more people. Um, it can also just be a much more capital efficient way to, to invest in something. Mm. Or it can be a way for um, somebody to get honest yield on their um, ETF uh, holdings because <clears throat> right, uh, <clears throat> most recently, there's some controversy as uh, Michael Saylor used the phrase risk free. Um, and that's uh, that's a scary one, right? Because really nothing is risk free. Um, and if somebody says there's there's no risk, then either they don't understand what the risk is or they're they're not telling you what the risk is. Right. Because every opportunity has, a, you know, a risk, right? Every thing where you can make money, there's also a scenario in which you can lose. So uh, if somebody sells covered call uh, they're selling options on their Bitcoin position. That means that in the event that Bitcoin goes up very sharply or uh, quickly, they could end up no longer having those Bitcoin, right? They end up 
getting a little bit of the upside and then missing the the remaining piece, right? And the issue with that is then if um, the dollar is losing value, then they just end up with dollars, right? And they might they might think now, oh wow, if I had this much dollars, I'd be great. But that's now, and maybe in the future you wouldn't think that. And the risk is that somebody could then um, end up selling their position because of the covered calls, and then they would end up buying in a potentially higher price. Um, but it but it also depends, right? So that that can also be useful a useful way for somebody if they were saying, okay, I have this much Bitcoin position, and I would sell a little piece of it at a certain price to actually start getting paid the premiums for being willing to do that now by locking in that future price. And then for somebody else, that could be a way for them to say, hey, I, I, need, I want to, um, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. I, I think we're going to a million dollars, you know, within a year. They can, if, if they're actually correct in that, they can make a lot more money by buying those calls that someone else is selling than just buying Bitcoin directly because it gives them much more leverage without the possibility of them being forced out of the position if Bitcoin drops first before it goes up. So is it fair to say that just like a lot of the existing tools inside of the fiat system now come to Bitcoin and a lot of the maturity of, of the asset is just increasing now with time with the ETF especially? Yeah, and the, the asset is becoming more mature. And um, I think that does result in uh, the price moving a little bit differently. I think that you do see uh, more funds saying, okay, we want to have 1% or 5% of our funds in Bitcoin, and we're going to rebalance, say, every quarter. And then the net result is, right, 5% for a massive, massive fund is a lot more than just a couple of regular people saying, oh, yeah, I want to put 50% of my money into that. And then the rebalancing effect means that if you have Bitcoin down, then they're going to buy more Bitcoin. And if Bitcoin goes way up, they're actually going to be selling some Bitcoin to get back down to that target level. So this has a stabilizing effect on the price of Bitcoin, actually, and it could result in a longer sustained rally, but without necessarily the, the really sharp moves or maybe more uh, retracements on the sharp moves when they occur. So this, this, this breaking of this four year cycle could actually occur with, within this uh, because the, the stabilizing and rebalancing effects are coming into Bitcoin. It could. And that's the case for something that would break that cycle. Just simply um, a new kind of capital coming in in a different way. Right. If you look at something like the launch of the first gold ETF in 2005, it didn't make gold just suddenly go what you know massively higher immediately and then that was it there was a large inflow of capital over many many years after that that you know that did change that market um <clears throat> so it, it's way too soon to say the cycle is over until it's over right if something is repeating multiple times you you should assume that it will continue until you see otherwise but now we have certain indications that that could be over right and again the cycle breaking does, is not necessarily good or a bad thing, right? It's not necessarily good for bulls or bears. Um, and in some ways, Bitcoin going up too sharply and then coming down sharply is is a risk for Bitcoin, right? Because you can have a lot more miners come online. And then if you have a huge drop in the price of Bitcoin, then they might shut those machines off and sell them. And that creates an opportunity for someone to be able to buy a large number of uh, idle ASICs that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. If somebody wanted to attack the network, that would be an opportunity for them to do so. Yeah, the, the, the mining aspect, I think we have even covered it uh, in the first podcast, but, but the <laughs> audience was very small, so I probably like probably like two people from, from here watching mm -hmm. <laughs> have seen that podcast or something like that. Uh, but it's an interesting topic, um, mining, because I think we even discussed that uh, when the price moves up, uh, and down, it doesn't immediately affect the Bitcoin mining hash rate, as we also seen, uh, I think, like uh, a year ago or one and a half years ago when we were kind of at the low uh, end of the market. Yeah. Mining hash rate still hit all time highs. Yeah, yeah. It just simply takes a long time. There's a huge lag. There's only so fast you can produce the chips. There's only so fast you can put them into ASICs. Only so fast you can um, find the sites and set them up and actually deploy that. So the net result is that a lot of times we've seen in previous bull markets, a lot of the hash rate that people wanted to put on while the price was going crazy 
ended up being deployed in the following year, um, leading to a particularly unpleasant mining environment where the price is going down and the hash rate is going up. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it's tough for the miners, but you know it isn't about the miners being happy because, again, if the miners are net unhappy, then miners will quit until the remaining ones are happy. Uh, so it's self-balancing uh, there. <clears throat> um, but as I said, if it, if it drops too sharply, then that poses more of a risk to the network. Um, but you see on uh, what Bitcoin Twitter, right? The uh, everybody loves these these models, these price models, and so on. Whether it's stock to flow or power law or so on, and basically, you can just look at a couple of points that happen, and, you know, draw a line through them, and say, oh yes, that will just continue forever, magically for no particular reason. Um, and this is really good for engagement. It's it's hopium. It's uh, you have the Bitcoin cheerleaders going, yeah, yeah, Bitcoin. They're just you know just gonna go up for for no reason, um, and uh, that's you know I mean it may be fun for them, but it's it's not helpful because um, <clears throat> Bitcoin has to survive in an adversarial environment, and uh, just thinking that things are inevitable is is actually counterproductive, right? You want to have your adversaries be complacent. You don't want to try to make yourself and people on your team more complacent and think it's already it's one because it's not until it is and even when it is it's not mm. um you know bitcoin is thing that needs to be continuously maintained continuously kept alive right you don't just mine it for the next couple of years and then shut the machines off and say you're done you don't just shut the nodes off and say you're done right if you if people stop using bitcoin or stop supporting it stop developing it it goes away and if nobody needs it, that's okay. But people need to understand that every aspect of that requires effort. There's actually uh, we have the new end routine. Oh no, I think it was already end routine uh, when when you were on the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest. Mm -hmm. And I remember the question for you was actually is Bitcoin innovatable? <laughs> It's so funny because that yeah. question. Let, let's put put the question now already uh, here and, and not and don't put it in the end because it suits so well here right now. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying Bitcoin is not innovatable and we have to continue work on it. What do you mean? What, what do you mean by that? Uh, like the end routine question was just like, is Bitcoin innovatable? Is the Bitcoin success story? Is Bitcoin oh, in be inevitable? Innova yeah, yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm her terrible yeah. English, no, sorry. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not inevitable. It's definitely, definitely not. Um, and again, I obviously I've, I've, you know, made my investment decisions accordingly. I've made, I've allocated my time accordingly that I'm quite confident in Bitcoin's success now, but it's not inevitable. There still are plenty of things that can go wrong. And uh, I, I like to imagine somebody, you know, builds a time machine and they, they go back to the early years of Bitcoin and, you know, say, oh, I'm going to buy up tons and tons of Bitcoin. And, you know, and they'll be they'll be thrilled. And then in that scenario, Bitcoin doesn't become a thing. Mm. Right. Maybe they've, you know, they've just altered the timeline. And maybe there was in the early days, there was only one scenario out of 100 where we are where we are now and the other ones something breaks some you know someone decides to attack the network when it's still very tiny um as something goes catastrophically wrong right whether it's the initial deployment of asics right when somebody when somebody has the first asic and nobody else does they they made a choice at that point you know to to mine honestly or to try to attack the network and maybe if things were things went differently we wouldn't be where we are so there's there's still plenty of things that can go wrong going forward. We're certainly not done. There's a lot of more work to be done. And there are certain things that um, we don't know what that's going to look like. Right. We don't know if uh, tomorrow somebody comes up with some super intelligent AI that starts breaking algorithms that have been uh, believed to be bulletproof. Is there a point um, where you say now Bitcoin is definitely a success? Is there a point where when, when those things are happening, uh, Bitcoin is definitely uh, something that, that will stay around for the next like 100, 200 years? Uh, is there some some like adoption point or metrics that, that it hits? I mean, I think Bitcoin is already a success in, in a number of ways. If, uh, it's kind of amazing to see so much of traditional finance coming over to it and trying to figure out what products they can offer um, the, the full the full suite of everything right the from custody 
to um, to later to you know lending against it and so on using it as collateral. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, as uh, as Yogi Berra said, predicting is hard, especially about the future. So um, and I think we've seen with a lot of things, the, some things are accelerating. So it's I think the world could look wildly dramatically different by twenty one forty. Um, if you think about things like, um, you know, the, the rate of AI is improving, people are putting, um, you know, computer chips in their head and have telepathy, um, what that might look like in terms of what encryption algorithms are still working, uh, or if, if people even have any privacy at all, right? If you need to be able to write down 12 seed words and keep them in your head, then is there a space in which you can do that? And is your head secure um, at that point? Uh, uh, certainly, I, I hope we we go in down a good scenario, um, but it's it's really hard to it's hard, it's hard to say. Things could look so completely different at that point. Um, you know, maybe money looks pretty different if you know everyone is telepathically communicating with everybody else. It's I don't a, know. It's an because money is a way for people to you know cooperate across space and time, but it's not the only way. So you know, society could evolve in a very unusual direction and. Oh, we'll see. I can only look maybe a couple of years out, or maybe one or two decades. Yeah, uh, 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 two decades is already a long time. If, yeah. if, if, if you like, we can always speculate and, and see what's the future. But it's really hard to predict the long term. Um, maybe uh, let's focus on what we can do with with Bitcoin now uh, um, to 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 improve it, to have uh, some uh, some some improvements for Bitcoin to make it scalable for the long run. There's a Lightning Network. There is potential soft forks. Uh, what can we do in, in in that area? Yeah, so it's it's been interesting to see those discussions, and um, it looks disorganized, but that's what Bitcoin governance is, right? There is no formal process of, well, you have this person has this role and this person has this role and these people have this many votes and they put it there and then there's another round. Um, it's it's literally, you know, people putting out ideas, talking to each other, writing code, other people commenting on that code, and then trying to, in some way, unspecified, to find a consensus for what makes sense to go forward. Um, so it's it's interesting that we saw with um, SegWit that was a uh, an upgrade where there was a lot of resistance and controversy and so on, um, even though that ultimately went through. Um, but then we had another uh, soft fork with Taproot where it was relatively non-controversial, as most people thought. Hey, I see a lot of upsides here. I don't see much downside, and it seemed like a, a logical continuation. Um, the interesting thing is where we are now. There isn't one logical path forward. There's a lot of people who see multiple different directions that Bitcoin can go in, as well as there's um, newly emboldened people who want Bitcoin to ossify. They want to just simply resist all changes, right? And there's even discussions within that and disagreements of what that looks like, right? Whether that means just bug fixes, whether that that means just you know minor improvements or whether you can actually add you know soft forks and so on and um or if it just means that you'll you'll need to do the absolutely necessary things like um <clears throat> potentially hard forks to fix major bugs that could be a factor decades from now um so i think it's great to see that discussion right whether um people are putting different things out there like uh ctv or opcat um, or even the idea of uh, maybe restoring lots and lots of previous ops co op codes and then just imposing some other kind of limit to keep things manageable. Um, and, it, you know, the, the challenge is, of course, seeing how those things would actually look, right? It's hard to think about the full implications of things because you have to consider if you enable one feature, how does that interact with all the previous features, but also any future changes we make. Um, and simply making any changes to Bitcoin does take time, right? There, there's still an ongoing process to get people to fully use all of Taproot's features. But also, we can't really rush things because part of the reason they didn't include certain upgrades in Taproot that they might have wanted to is because it wasn't clear then what was the best way to do that or whether there would be even better optimizations for some of the things they wanted to do. So as as time passes, as people are work, continue working on this and discussing this, they find better ways to do things. 
um, they think that, you know, they say, okay, well, I have this really cool idea, but it requires this soft fork. It requires this op code. And then after working on it for a year or two years, maybe sometimes 10 years, then they realize, oh, actually, there is a way to do it without that op code. Maybe there is a way to just do it now. And there might be some kind of trade off in terms of, you know, the cost or the speed or the elegance of the solution. But they they find that there is a way to to do it without that. And um, that's pretty cool. And then you can see what the level of demand for that actually is, how much people want to use it. And if people do want to use it, then maybe you can get the consensus for other changes that would make it even better. It's really interesting when we talk about the Bitcoin code, because it seems like it's already a very stable thing that should not um, change too much. But there also seems to be a risk if we say like, oh, no, it's <laughs> it's fixed and done and we will never ever touch it again. Right, right. If you completely stopped updating the code base, Bitcoin would eventually start falling apart. Um, <clears throat> So there's a there's a section of there's a region of India that's um, extremely humid and has lots of small small creeks through it. So people figured out how to um, grow the trees across these uh, these creeks these streams, and you basically have these living wooden bridges. And because the the bridges are still made from wood that's alive, they don't they don't rot they don't decay. If you chop down the trees and built a wooden bridge, as soon as you built it, it would start falling apart. It would start degrading. So the effect is you're, you're taking advantage of the fact that the tree is constantly updating and making these improvements to itself, even though the bridge itself isn't really noticeably changing. So you Bitcoin needs to be uh, refreshed in that way just to stay where it is, to be compatible with the changes in other aspects of the computer operating systems and so on, right? Other <clears throat> internet protocols that it's interacting with. Um, those those aren't static. Those are changing. Um, and in fact, if you you know go back and try to you know run original Bitcoin clients, it's it's not as easy as you think. If you go back and try to run computer software from the 1980s or so on, it's it's not that straightforward. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so e there's just even that minimum level to keep where you are. But also that people over time might find other bugs or there might be you know, flaws in some kind of algorithm or method that Bitcoin is using that needs to be fixed. Um, and so that's the, that's the absolute minimum there, right? And then also that sometimes the world can change dramatically, right? There may be different needs and so on. And that if you keep things the same, they don't actually stay the same, right? If you look at um, an area like San Francisco, where they built a lot of these um, single family homes in the city, um, they thought, oh, no, we don't want to, you know, more people are moving here, but we don't want to build tall build, you know, a lot of tall buildings replacing these single family homes because that would change the city. So they kept the single family homes. But then the problem is instead of one normal person living in there, now there's maybe, you know, there's a whole bunch of people paying a lot of money each, you know, sharing a room. So the place did change, right? Um, even though you said you weren't going to change anything simply because there's more demand, right? And that's you know, we saw that happen with Bitcoin, where there were years of essentially no no effective limit on block size because it was never reached, because there was never enough demand to actually run up against those limits. And then once people started running up against those limits, the the way Bitcoin worked seemed to change. So nothing was changed, and yet it seemed like a change was made because of that change in demand. So then there were, that's why you had people saying. Oh, well, let's just keep making the block size bigger so it can be like how it was again. We need to change it so it can go back to being unchanged. Um, and you can do that, but up to a point before it then breaks Bitcoin in other ways. Hmm. So that's that's why you had that incredible tension of people saying, well, no, we need to scale in a smarter way, not just a, a brute force way. But the problem is scaling in a smarter way takes much more time. It takes much more sophistication and it's harder to explain to people how it works. And um, I think that's one of the the reasons that we've seen some of that frustration with, with Lightning now, even though Lightning has come such a long way from from uh, six years ago, um, it's gotten better and better. Um, but Lightning works really well when you are having these bi-directional payment flows, when you're getting paid in Lightning sats, and then you're spending in Lightning sats. Right. And then you're you're using that same channel liquidity over and over and over. 
um, when you have more directional flows, when it's more that you're getting paid in it or you're mostly spending in it, but not both, then you need to um, open and close channels more often, right? You need to do more on-chain transactions. Uh, you need to uh, splice channels and so on. And uh, you need to rebalance the liquidity and that you don't get as strong a scaling effect, right? You don't get to see the real seamless nature of it when it's uh, you have to go back to the base layer so much. Um, so so that's why I think you uh, some people are frustrated because there's this very strong network effect of Lightning and people don't realize that network effect is great when when you have the network already built out, right? But when the network is still very small, then the network effect is working against you because you think, okay, great, I need to I need to go, you know, open these channels. And now if there's not enough places to spend lightning, if there's not enough opportunities to get paid in it or use it, if there's not enough exchanges that are supporting it, then then it feels like that that capital is is not being active, right? It feels like it's it's outside, it's locked. Whereas when you get to a situation where lots of people are using lightning, you're using it all the time, lots of people accept it, then it feels like anything that's not lightning is the locked capital. And when you've moved it into lightning, you've you've gotten something that's much more um, effective and useful. Um, so it, it, there are some some circular economies that have started to uh, uh, build up. And I, I'd like to, uh, you know, see some of them sometime. I, I've heard uh, things are happening in like Uvita, Costa Rica, um, and in uh, Berlin, El Salvador, and, and some of those places. Um, but I, I just want to say uh, it's pretty amazing to go to PubKey in New York City. You know, I've been there a few times um, passing through. And uh, it's a it's a Bitcoin bar, but it looks like a regular dive bar. And uh, the the payment with Lightning there is perfectly seamless. I mean, you can also pay with a cash or credit card, but it is, a, you know, it's a really seamless experience. Um, and the, the food is actually good as well. And it's pretty amazing that you go there and you, you run into some uh, interesting Bitcoiners. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it makes me wonder where where are the altcoin theme bars, <laughs> right? Because, you know, if you look at coin market cap, it shows these things that's, you know, in the, in the billions and billions of dollars. Um, but is it is it just an online phenomenon? You know, is there is there really some real real world traction here? Are there people that are passionate enough to say, Hey, you know, my coin is money, so here's something where you can just use it in that regular way. Uh, or maybe maybe I just haven't heard of it, but I I don't think that that's there. I never heard about that. Yeah. Uh, it's also interesting because I think the most the, the biggest altcoin that still gets uh into my comments is still Bitcoin Cash, which is mm -hmm. uh fascinating for me because it's by far not the biggest altcoin uh, it's a it, it's a free market has kind of decided that bitcoin is the way to go and bitcoin cash crashed massively but this is a comment i get like at least once a week uh, maybe even like every other day um like oh bitcoin is great but bitcoin cash we need for for payment rates and then i'm like no, like I, I go to bars in Vienna, even there's like a mm -hmm. nice uh, bar and restaurant here where you can pay with lightning. There are multiples, but I wonder where there's a real Bitcoin are working and, and stuff like that. Uh, and I use lightning a lot for, for, for payments here and there at Bitcoin conferences, uh, or, but also like in, in regular bars and New York City bars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> by, by the way, uh, uh, you probably also saw the video where uh, the first president uh, uh, Trump pr made a Bitcoin transaction or watched a Bitcoin transaction b before him. So that's pretty interesting. What's your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, it, it's funny to to go to a dive bar and then later see see a you know video video <laughs> like that. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I also you know went to a uh, basement in uh, in Riga, Latvia, right after mm -hmm. the uh, Baltic Honey Badger conference. Um, and that's also, you know, Bitcoin theme bar. They have some some nice, um, you know, memorabilia there. Um, and, uh, you know, the owner, the owner's orange build. Right. Um, and that's uh, I think that's one, you know, the key there. Right. If the owner really appreciates it and understands uh, the significance, then that that drives that drives its success more than anything. Um, <clears throat> but. But yeah, the uh, people spending Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, right, that doesn't have as much impact on the price. The people just hoarding it, 
has a huge impact on the price, right? And people buy sending and buying, you know, that 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 starts to build up that economy. That starts to make it a real thing and not just some, oh well, maybe somebody will use this someday. But but at the same time that it's just much less of an effect. So if everyone is spending something but nobody actually wants to have it, then the actual price or value of it, it stay you know, the equilibrium is pretty low. Um, and you can, the way I like to look at it is like the, the syn synthetic hodlers, right? If somebody, uh, you know, buys a certain amount of, um, Bitcoin and then just sends it to somebody else. And then that person cashes out of it to the local fiat currency. Um, let's say, you know, the amount of time, the money was stored in Bitcoin was one day, right? So then it's one 365th of, if you had held it for a full year in terms of the impact on the price. If you imagine lots of other people buying in for a day and selling, right? Because when you sell the Bitcoin, then it's going to somebody else and maybe they hold on to it for a day and then they sell it. So you, you know, 365 people has the effect of one person who just bought those Bitcoin and just sits on it for the full year um, in terms of the impact on the price. So it's great when it, things are circulating. Um, and uh, it's, it's another way to orange pill people as well, that people see Oh, hey, you know, this person just, uh, you know, took the card tapped. Oh, that was that was a Bitcoin payment. You know, um, I thought it was hard, right? Because even with the, the comments, you know, from the PubKey video, you know, people are saying, oh, yeah, but it doesn't it take like, you know, 15 minutes or something. It's like, no, no look, look, look at the video. Um, and the nice thing with Lightning is that's that's actually done, right? It is actually settled when you get that payment um, in notification, whereas uh, with with any kind of just layer one blockchain, you, um, you know, a lot of times the user interface tells you, oh yeah, I went through, but there still might be zero confirmations, or maybe there's one confirmation, but that's not quite enough on, on that blockchain that you're using. So it's easy for the user interface to try to make it look like it's, it's final or whatever. But, um, if it's, if it's not final, then that's, uh, that's misleading people in order to market it. There's also an interesting debate going on with uh, hodling Bitcoin and just using fiat and whatever is left in fiat putting in Bitcoin versus uh, putting it all in Bitcoin. And when you need money, you spend your Bitcoin and then replace the Bitcoin in order to uh, try to get more transactions to get more volume in, in the spending way on, on top of Bitcoin. I personally just like spend in fiat and then put it in Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, it's, it seems to be the easier thing, but is there something to do that spend so, and replace thing? Yeah. There, again, I think different people are going to use Bitcoin in different ways. And it's, it's like telling somebody they're, they're eating the, you know, eating the pizza wrong or, or something, <laughs> you know, you, you're not supposed to fold it. You know, you, you have to do it like this. Okay. Well, that, that's your opinion. Um, so, so, right. So some people want to spend and replace some people just want to accumulate Bitcoin. Um, and, and that's okay. Right. And some people just want to spend Bitcoin and really not keep much of their money in it. And that's also, and that's also okay. And different people are contributing in different ways, right? They don't, they don't have necessarily the same impact on the price or the same impact on the circular economy, but that's okay. Some people are developers. Some people are user interface designers and some people are just users right some people are educators some people are you know running hedge funds um and that's that's okay so different people have a role to play um i do just do find it funny if somebody you know buys bitcoin only as an investment and then they don't want to spend it and they somehow get mad at other people that are spending it <laughs> and and what i say to these people is okay if you never spend any bitcoin then you don't have you don't have much of your money in bitcoin you know, it's easy to say, you know, never spend it if 10% of your net worth is in Bitcoin. But if you are one of the people that's crazy enough to have 90%, 100% or more of your net worth in Bitcoin, then you have to spend it. You have to sell it sometimes. You know, you have to convert it into other forms on occasion because it, it's simply necessary in order to function. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's, it's funny because I actually ran into this problem myself because... Uh, um, 
most of my sponsors actually pay me now in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So I get not only my salary mostly now in Bitcoin, but I store also my wealth in Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. So, so I kind of have to figure out how to, to pay the fiat bills. In order for that, uh, I either have to loan against my Bitcoin or I have to sell my Bitcoin and, and right. spend in, in fiat. So that's a that's an interesting point where yeah. I am because I, I have to use Bitcoin as a, as a currency because it's just a, such a dominant position in mine. So yeah, that's a really great point of yours. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and also the whether spend and replace makes sense also depends on what country you're in and what taxes you have to pay because in, in some places the spend and replace could create a, a tax mess and leading to you having less Bitcoin ultimately. Um, uh, so, um, and then the question is, right, where, where are you spending the Bitcoin? Because if you're spending the Bitcoin at a, with a Bitcoiner who wants, who wants that Bitcoin is keeping it, that's just indirectly hobbling, mm. right? If there's, um, I was at the, uh, I got to swing by the Stockholm, uh, Bitcoin meetup and it was actually a pretty good one. Um, and there was, uh, someone there who is a, you know, a rancher and has, uh, cows and he wanted to see how he could accept Bitcoin. He didn't know that much about it. Um, so if he's, you know, going to get paid in Bitcoin and keeping it, then if somebody needs to buy food and then instead of going to the supermarket and paying fiat, they give their Bitcoin to this person who keeps it and then they receive the food from him. Um, that's that's just hodling one step removed. Right. But if you just go to some mega corporation like McDonald's or Starbucks and you say, oh, I pay with Bitcoin, but they instantly convert it into fiat and just essentially sold it to somebody they don't care who um is that that different than you just selling your bitcoin and then just handing them the fiat yeah. right you're using different rails but it's it's not you know getting bitcoin into the hands of people who really want it and appreciate it if you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis i guess you already bought some bitcoin and now the most important step is to keep the bitcoin keep them secure in a hardware wallet my personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the bitbox it's super secure it's simple to set up it's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the bitcoin on an exchange and you can get a five percent discount with the code robin at the checkout visit bitbox.swiss robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step and if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty and last but not least i have something completely new for you guys i partnered up with coin vigilante this is the most beautiful bitcoin timepiece that i ever saw created by anyone look at that beauty i love it so much coin vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante time pieces those watches are amazing i love them so much it was really hard for me to pick the one that i want to have because there are a lot of great options i went with the new transparency edition they are all limited it. so grab yours those will not be available for a long time but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way that's a good point like because you have to consider who's the bitcoin on the other end that's why i like that's why i said uh, there's this restaurant bar where i actually know he's a bitcoiner he's watching the podcast mm. he's actually educated on the stuff he even wants to make content in his bar in his restaurant uh, around bitcoin I'm like, okay, yeah, I, like, yeah. I, I like spending there some, some sats there. Uh, but, but when it's like McDonald's, as you said, like, yeah, it will, it will probably vanish. It's, it's not even uh, going on the balance sheet anywhere. <laughs> it's a really interesting point. Um, do you see in general the Lightning Network as the next fundamental base layer for, for payment rails in, in Bitcoin? Is that, that, that network effect already so big that like it has to be Lightning or is there still like room for other layer twos? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of room for other layer twos depending on what it is people want to do and what their needs are and what their what their trade offs are. So <clears throat> I think we might even see a situation where a lot of other layer twos or eCash or other things like that become uh, very popular and dominant for a number of years. And then when you get to that point where there's just much, much more people that are interacting with Bitcoin in some way, then the that effect, that strong network effect of lightning, I think, might actually kick in beyond just a you know, core of really committed early adopters that you have the general public saying, oh, yeah, this is just this is actually easier since I'm, you know, I, I'm spending money roughly equivalent to what I'm being paid and uh, I'm getting money in and out in sats. I think that really works a lot. Um, but <clears throat> one of the things I think that will really help with with lightning adoption is helping letting people not denominate in bitcoins if they can actually send and receive on the lightning network and have their their number of sats fluctuate but their number of dollars or local currency uh, stable or relatively stable that really helps with adoption you know then they can ease their way into it they don't have to have a new payment system and a new kind of money and you know a new uh, uh, chart to watch all at the same time they can just take one piece and then maybe they can switch it to, you know, 10% Bitcoin, 90% synthetic dollars and, and slowly turn that dial as their risk tolerance allows or as their preferences allow or as more people around them are switching over. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it, it's actually a little sad to see there's there's been a couple of projects um, in the past year that have shut down that were really good. There was one project that was essentially trying to build a, a lightning wallet uh, like this of that form where you could um, in a decentralized way, adjust your exposure to to Bitcoin and the dollar. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that there's this big demand to educate the general public on the basics of Bitcoin. But I also feel there's a need to educate Bitcoiners on some of the really cool things that have been built or should be built in Bitcoin and why why they're important, why that will help with adoption um, that you if you want to replace the banking system, you need to actually replace the different parts of it, not just the not just the money part. Mm, and it's a big fun. And it's also this real world use cases make a huge difference in your head when you already see like, oh, that, that's actually a good thing that is happening in Bitcoin and Bitcoin makes it so much easier to use. For example, um, I mentioned before sponsor, uh, one of them is uh, is based in America, which first wanted to actually figure out how to do the fiat payment. Uh, and and he was like, oh, like, give me this, give me this, give me this. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I have to, I have to give a lot, like I have to give a lot of information. There's a lot like routing numbers, all those things yeah. uh, involved in that between America and Austria. Uh, and then I was like, can we just do it in Bitcoin? <laughs> and he was like, ah, okay, let's just do it in Bitcoin. Uh, and it was so easy. We, we did it on a Sunday afternoon and it was done in 20 minutes. The whole process of uh, switching to, ah, let's not do it in fiat, let's do it in Bitcoin. I set our, uh, up, up everything on my side. He set our, everything up on his side. Uh, and I didn't have to get it in my bank account, which would have taken a few business days, then would have gotten the money from the bank account to the uh, exchange, then from the exchange to my wallet. Uh, no, I just like directly do the do the wallet, and it's like wow, that's 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 amazing. Yeah, so there's there's plenty of cases where paying with Bitcoin is so much so much better. Uh, again, in in the basement bar in Riga, Latvia, just hey, done. Okay, what's the local currency of Latvia? Don't know. Doesn't matter, <laughs> right? What country am I in? I don't care. Um, it's it's kind of beautiful. Say, like, oh no, I'm in a Bitcoin place. I can spend Bitcoin. Um, you know, I, this is somebody said something clever on Nostr. Okay. Just send them a hundred sats. Right. Um, and trying to figure out how to, how to send a hundred, the equivalent of a hundred sats to somebody through the traditional financial system <laughs> when you don't know, uh, you know, what country they're even in. Um, that's, that's a big problem, right? It's either more difficult or costly or impossible. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm a big fan of using Bitcoin when it, when it makes sense like that, but there are certain things where it's. Bitcoin payments are, are not the right solution or it's not ready. So, for example, if I'm traveling and I want to rent a car for a few days, <clears throat> uh, renting a car with my credit card makes a lot of sense. It already includes some some coverage and no additional cost to me. And uh, I don't have to put a lot of money 
I don't have to send the person a lot of money, right? And they don't have to 100% trust me either. So when I, you know, show them my credit card, then they can charge me more money later if I've somehow damaged the car or whatever, right? But then there's also a dispute process built in where I can say, hey, no, there, there wasn't damage and I have video and, you know, reverse charges if necessary. Um, there, there just isn't something like that for Bitcoin right now. And you could build that, right? But uh, it hasn't really been built. And then, again, the steps are you have to come up with an idea that makes sense. You have to build it. You have to polish it and you have to get it out there and get people using it, right? So we're we're a long ways away from enough people wanting to rent a car with Bitcoin that someone's going to build that and have it ready to go. So that's why I, I think it makes sense to use the right tool for the job, right? Like the, the joke, you know, someone gets a hammer and they run around looking for things to, to hammer with it, right? That's not the right approach, right? Usually you want to start with a problem and then say, what's what's tool is the right solution? Not, I have a I have a tool, where are my problems? <laughs> um, but it is tempting because you get excited about Bitcoin because Bitcoin is pretty amazing. Um, but I am definitely a fan of using the, the right tool for the job, whether that's Bitcoin, a local you know, fiat currency or a credit card. Yeah, it's also, uh, it's a little bit how I see it also with spending Bitcoin right now, especially in Austria, because there's like a 27.5% uh, capital gains tax on them. If you bought them uh, after February 2021, if you were lucky enough to buy, bought Bitcoin before that, they are completely tax free. Mm -hmm. uh, for my Austrian folks out there that bought Bitcoin before that, you can actually spend them tax free. Um, but for other than they're like, yeah, they, they, they have Bitcoin, they really desperately want to spend them uh, because they have, want to have that feeling. And it's, it's great. Like if, if you want to do that and contribute to the network in, in, in that way, but it's like running around with the hammer and, and searching for mm -hmm. a solution when you have fiat in your bank account and just use that money to spend and use your Bitcoin as a store of value. Right. And um, as, as you mentioned before, right, there are people who are trying to be all in on Bitcoin. They're trying to be on their own personal Bitcoin standard. The issue is that if you go to 100% Bitcoin and you have no local fiat currency, no credit card, no bank account, it in a lot of societies, it's hard to function, right? It's hard to rent an apartment, hard to buy a car, hard, hard to buy a house, or, or, or really a lot of things. Um, it's different if you're living in some Bitcoin jungle somewhere. But, uh, but much easier is for someone to say, okay, well, I'm going to have you know, whatever, 90% the money in Bitcoin and then keep the reigning 10% in fiat, keep the bank accounts and so on <clears throat> for the time being. Or at least in the U.S., they can use a credit union, which is like a, a you know, better than a bank in some ways. Um, and uh, or if they're or if they insist on being 100% Bitcoin, you can be net 100% Bitcoin. So you could have, you know, basically, basically borrow some money and then, you know, you can have even more Bitcoin and you have debt. And then you have operating cash. So you have operating cash, you can still be in the system, but your your debt in dollars or euros exceeds the actual balance you're keeping. So your your net exposure is is negative or zero to the fiat system while you're still able to use it for purposes as you need. Um, so I think that you know that can make more sense than someone trying to just be purely Bitcoin at, at this point in time. Um, but that's more an ideological thing, right? Because if you're very bullish on Bitcoin, it doesn't really matter whether you're 80 percent, 90 percent or 100 percent in it mm -hmm. in, in that sense. Right. If you think, you know, if you're that bullish on Bitcoin, then what you know, then you're just being greedy at that point. It's a, Let it, other people get a little Bitcoin, too. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't take it all. <laughs> the, not, not not all the Bitcoin should go to Michael Saylor. <laughs> yeah. And of course, it's much healthier if you have a market where you know, 90% of the population has 1% of their wealth in Bitcoin versus 1% of the population has 90% of their wealth in Bitcoin, mm. right? You want, you want that broader base, not only just for, you know, the politicians to realize that it's, it's important and, you know, and, and that kind of thing and have favorable laws, but also because it just results in a much more stable system. Right. If you have a lot of people, a few people who are very overexposed, it's easy for them to get squeezed out or be financially pressured. I, I mean, I even worried about some of the these conferences. It's like, OK, well, there's 50,000 Bitcoiners showing up and, you know, this is going to cost everyone thousands of dollars in airfare and hotel rooms and so on. If they're selling Bitcoin for this, you know, we're we're creating our own bear market here. <laughs> you know, we, we could have just we could have just used Zoom 
or you know or just not have the conference somewhere expensive have it at have it at um an airport hotel you know in uh some some cheap uh cheap area but then no donald trump and all the uh, mainstream celebrities would show up uh then we can discuss if that's a good thing or bad thing for conferences but yeah like well well that that's true right and i think that um it's good that the bitcoin magazine conference has gone back to to moving it around because then you have it in different places and um it ha it has certain certain benefits for new people to get to it now it's their local conference but also um an opportunity for for local politicians or other people to to show up and then realize that there is uh, a pretty significant group of people who are passionate about this and there isn't a corresponding large group of people that are passionately against it so it's it's really just uh it's upside to to want to support something that's the future mm. I, i like the 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 way you look at uh leave, leave some bitcoin for other people because i think uh, but i'm joking because of course yeah, you can't yeah. you can't you know no matter how much bitcoin you take then there's still enough value for other people yeah yeah uh, yeah absolutely and uh but it's an interesting mindset because i think most bitcoiners actually have fear of missing out completely when they have bitcoin like they are like mm. Uh, or oh, I have to have more Bitcoin. You always have this fear of like not having enough Bitcoin, no matter what the uh, entry is. Someone with zero zero point zero 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 one Bitcoin has probably the same fear as someone with like ten Bitcoin, uh, which is like completely out of the scales. Um, but it's it's interesting that that we we have that fear of missing out because like oh now now maybe now the the bull run starts and we are tomorrow at six hundred thousand. Yeah, and that can be the case where. Again, things can go sideways for a very long time and then then go vertical, right? It doesn't have to uh, cooperate with you in terms of what what you want or um, <clears throat> um, and again, yeah, you, you do the calculation of okay, well, 21 million Bitcoin divided by eight billion people, and that's point zero zero. <laughs> Wait, what? You know? So um, you know, if you have whatever, if someone says they have, you know, a thousand dollars in Bitcoin now, they already have more than their fair share um <clears throat> but but it's also so i mean they should feel good in terms of okay they have more than their fair share but also have some real realistic assumptions about what that could be worth right because while there's no limit in in just pure fiat terms right that that doesn't mean it that doesn't mean anything right the question is how much food can you buy how much fuel can you buy how much energy can you buy with a certain amount of bitcoin Uh, because again, right? The you know you you can go around you can go out and buy the hundred trillion dollars Zimbabwe note right now, right? And you can say you're a trillionaire, um, but that doesn't that you know that those those numbers are not helpful. So I like to put it in terms of like acres of land, right? Acres of usable land is something that's scarce. You can't just snap your fingers and say, okay, I just made lots more usable land. Um, so if you look at it now, uh, there's this you know, website I was looking at in the U.S. where they have listings. You can buy 10,000 acres of um, usable land somewhere, and it's, it's quite expensive, right? And um, you can say, well, there's only 21 million Bitcoin. Well, there's not that many parcels of 10,000 acres of land. So, so there, is some, there is some upper limit to the you know, purchasing power of Bitcoin. Um, and I don't want to rain on people's parade, but it's it's there somewhere, right? You can always say some fiat number. Okay, sure, it eventually reach that. But is a Bitcoin going to be worth more than ten thousand acres of land? I don't think so. Not ever. Mm. And that's okay, right? That's there's still there's still you know room to run there. But you've just established some reasonable upper bound where if someone thinks they have point zero 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 one Bitcoin, that's going to you know make them super rich in some future world. I I really don't think so. But it's better. It's definitely better to be off zero. Yeah, it's, it's it's interesting because basically every price prediction will be probably true at some point, uh, especially yeah. when the fiat currency completely goes away. Then at least at at some point you will hit all those one billion dollars per Bitcoin mm -hmm. price targets that seem completely outlandish now. But it's way more interesting than compare it to gold and real estate. That's like the, uh, and acres of land. Like those things yeah. is, is is for me the most interesting way to measure bitcoin in because even like gold is kind of the 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 the, the longest running oldest sound money asset uh, and it 
kind of makes sense for me to, to measure Bitcoin in, in, in gold. And right now, uh, a kilo price of one gold uh, is like 75,000. I think the last time I, I looked, maybe I'm completely off, but I think mm. it was like 75,000 for one kilogram of, of gold. Uh, it's it's uh, funny enough, quite uh, quite um, close enough to Bitcoin. One Bitcoin price uh, is one kilogram of gold. Um, so when you look at uh, those proportions of those like, okay, what, what will like 0.1 Bitcoin actually mean? What will one Bitcoin actually mean uh, in a Bitcoin world when we think of like Bitcoin is actually successful as like most people have it as a store of value. Most people uh, transact with it. Like it's, a, it's like it's the main currency that most people on earth uh, use it, that, that hyper Bitcoin is say have a bitcoin sized world do you have some framework around like okay what, what will like an acre of land cost in in, in bitcoin what will like a, a piece of, of gold cost like in bitcoin yeah I, I mean i don't i don't have a prediction on that i'm just trying to look at what a reasonable upper bound is so if someone says okay you know bitcoin the all bitcoin equals the market cap of gold for example okay that that's a reasonable thing to say and then you can look at how much gold that corresponds to right whether it's you know, maybe it's one one Bitcoin equals one good delivery bar of gold, right? The 400 ounces. Um, <clears throat> uh, but then people can also make the case that, you know, Bitcoin will be worth more than gold. And you can say, well, OK, maybe gold loses some some of its appeal as a store of value um, because it certainly has that. Right. If you look at, say, the gold price versus the you know, platinum um, price over, you know, over the last 20 years. Right. They used to they used to have some correlation, but really platinum has just completely flatlined uh, over many, many years while while gold is actually hitting new all time highs now, um, <clears throat> simply because platinum 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 is rarer than gold. Right. And we also don't have a way to just snap our fingers and make it. Um, and uh, it's just that, uh, you know, gold is seen as the store of value metal. Um, so the premium goes there. Um, so these people speculate that gold could lose its premium, but also there's, you can make a case that Bitcoin will become more valuable than gold because of its digital nature. If you imagine a world and say, okay, there's 8 billion people, but there's going to be a hundred billion robots running around, right? Maybe, or maybe they're tiny drones maybe, or whatever. They don't have to be humanoid robots, but they're going to spend Bitcoin, right? They're not going to be spending gold coins or, or, you know, whatever fiat currency is available. Then you could make a case that there's, there's an even bigger market. That doesn't exist yet. Just like you know, Uber, you know, had that that pos that potential to take more than the existing taxi markets by being so much more convenient, and that someone would be like, yeah, I'm going to use this to commute to work. You know, I'm going to you know take this all over the place as opposed to like having to make a phone call and tell someone your address and then you know hope they show up. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. So it pretend you could potentially expand the market further. Um, but again, with uh, with a, a lot of these, uh, you know, Bitcoin price models, they're not even specifying. Are they talking about, you know, absolute dollars, right? You're talking about just the just the nominal number. You're talking about fixed by a certain year. You know, I mean, what about what happens with with uh, that policy? Um, and, you know, again, the supply is the supply is important only as long as it's not too crazy. Right. And, um, you know, we, we've seen there's a lot of different currencies, both cryptocurrencies and regular that there's there's some leeway with the supply, right? You can have a situation where maybe the supply goes up a little, maybe it goes down a little, maybe it goes up a bit more. And that doesn't have as much an impact on the price of things as people think. It's only when the supply is really just increasing too much that uh, the value is diluted and things collapse. Um, so it's 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 always been more about the demand. Mm -hmm. It's very much about the demand and um, <clears throat> Bitcoin's biggest price increases in relative terms were when the, the inflation rate and the monetary inflation rate of Bitcoin was super high. When Bitcoin had a monetary inflation rate over 10%, that was when Bitcoin was making these huge gains. And it was because you had even bigger gains in the demand for it. Um, so that's really going to be the driving factor going forward. The, the halvings are less significant and it's a matter of okay how many how many people are adopting this uh as a store of value and how many people are adopting it for other purposes 
Mm. It will be really interesting to see. Uh, I, I like it. Yeah. Um, one last part that I want to get in the in, in the podcast also, as you are a long term hodler already, and I'm aware that at every uh, Bitcoin conversation there are some new people listening. There's someone that maybe just found a Bitcoin video and it's maybe like in his first like one, two, maybe even three, four Bitcoin po uh, welcome <laughs> Bitcoin yeah. videos. Um, what are some of the lessons you have learned, uh, some things that you, um, some of the mistakes maybe you have made that you don't want to repeat or uh, early people that are now in there, they should not do? Um, yeah, the, the number one mistake um, that I and other people have made, right, is simply giving your Bitcoins to somebody else, letting somebody else hold your keys. For whatever reason, whether it's because it's it's an exchange uh, where you want to trade it, or because it you know seems to be earning yield from nowhere, or uh, that you know you think that they might be able to store it more securely than you can, um, that that's one of the biggest things that leads to people simply not getting their bitcoins back, right? And if you don't get your bitcoins back, does it really matter why, right? Whether they lost it or they choose not to give it back to you or it was hacked, whether it's an inside job or external threat. Doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? Or maybe there was a you know, controversial fork and they, the custodian has decided to give you back the forked coins because they believe those are the real Bitcoin and they don't give you back the real Bitcoin. Um, there's a lot of ways it can go wrong, including ways you don't anticipate. And remember that you also have to authenticate yourself to the custodian. And ultimately, there's no better way to authenticate yourself than by signing a message with private keys. Uh, so... <clears throat> So, you know, two-factor authentication, a pat login, a password, email, those are all not as good as just keeping private keys private and signing a message with them. And if you can do that, then you can hold your Bitcoin. Um, it's also important to make sure you have a proper backup and you want to think about different threat models, different ways things can go wrong, right? What if there's a, a natural disaster in your area, right? Are the backups right next to, you know, harbor wallets? and your computer or cell phone, right? Um, what, you know, what does it look like if, uh, you know, whatever, you, you go through a divorce or, you know, or, a, you know, family member develops a gambling problem, right? You have to think about your, you know, whether those Bitcoins are secure in those situations. You also want to make sure you have enough Bitcoin that it, you know, you'll actually be happy if the price goes up in the future as opposed to angry. Uh, but you don't want so many Bitcoin that you'll be forced to sell out if the price drops or there's an unexpected bear market. Because, you know, uh, you could say like, oh, man, you know, if I, if I bought Bitcoins at this price, they're like, okay, but the next thing that happened was the price dropped 85%. All right. Um, if you look at uh, like Tim Draper, uh, you know, bought, uh, I believe it was 30,000 Bitcoins at $600. And the next thing that happened was the price dropped 75%. And, uh, you know, people wanted to be like, ha idiot, you know, you, you must feel pretty stupid. You spent all this money and, you know, you're down million, millions of dollars, right? And he's like, no, this is a long-term purchase. And it was, right? And now in retrospect, he's, you know, he looks pretty good buying this Bitcoin at $600, even if it went to 150 first. But if he was forced to sell at 150, then it was all for nothing. You know, then the Bitcoins are gone, the loss is locked in, and then you just get to watch the train leave without him. Mm. <clears throat> um, and yeah, uh, I think as, as Matt O'Dell says, you know, stay humble, sat, stack sats, right? It's important not to think you're, you know, too clever or whatever, you figured out something else or to, to brag about what you've done is, is a bad idea for, for a lot of reasons. Um, it's easy for people to you know, start thinking they're, they're a genius, right? As I say, everyone thinks they're a genius in a bull market um, and make some kind of mistake. Um, and, uh, you know, to be aware of, uh, of one's emotions, right? That it's okay to experience fear and greed, but to not let them, you know, make the decisions for you. I think those are those are great points. That, that lets me do one more question um, that I have a lot. Bitcoin are quite unique uh, characters right now yeah what if bitcoin is actually successful how does the world look like when all those bitcoiners who actually held and have those mindsets and those unique characters are then uh the 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 elite and then are the the big money givers uh in philanthropy uh, in like charity and all those things what can that change in 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 the world yeah i i think that 
actually could have a strong positive effect. Um, there was a, uh, a Bitcoiner whose identity is unknown who created the Pineapple Fund with 5,000 Bitcoins. And uh, they actually solicited comments for, you know, hey, what, what should I fund with this that would have the most benefit for humanity? Um, and they ended up funding a, a lot of uh, different interesting projects that, that might not have gotten that level of money or interest otherwise. Um, I think it will it will be pretty neat to see what some some Bitcoiners can do at some point in time, uh, in terms of funding new kinds of research or or AI or or building tools. Uh, people need right right now a lot of the apps people rely on for common day to day things are are run by for profit companies, and sometimes those companies have goals that are at odds with 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 the users. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for someone to build like nonprofit versions of these these apps that are not trying to extract the value, but rather give it back to the users. Um, things like that, right? The the people who made money from WhatsApp then you know turned around and created Signal, for example. So there you could you could see a lot of things like that. Um, and of course the people who you know might not know what to do with the money, right? So and and that's okay, right? They can leave it to children. Or they might see, you know, other Bitcoiners and might say, hey, these are these are things you can do. This is what other people are doing that's uh, beneficial for humanity. And you can do it as well. Um, but, you know, again, the good thing with Bitcoin is <clears throat> if someone has a bunch of Bitcoin, they can either spend it or not. Those are basically the options, right? They can't just, uh, you know, have unlimited money flowing in from it in perpetuity, like, a, you know, aristocratic land grant or, or something. Um, they, uh, you know, so either, at, either, you know, they, they don't spend it or, or they do. And if they spend it, then it's gone and, um, it just goes to other people and, and circulates. Uh, I think that's also a great point because a lot of people think, oh, like there are those, then those, those rich people in Bitcoin, but they eventually have to either spend it or they, <laughs> they will die with it or they give it the, the grand, the, the kids and they mm -hmm. will spend it. Like yeah. it, it, it comes in a natural flow and it's not like fiat where you can make yield on your money, uh, without having, uh, something, something off. Like, like there's, there's no, no, not this rent seeking on top of Bitcoin. Yeah. And there's a, there's a faction of Bitcoiners that <clears throat> I call them uh, medieval peasants that for some reason they, they, uh, I don't know, they, they like the, futuristic Bitcoin, but then everything else that they, they like things how they were hundreds of years ago, <laughs> or seem to think that's better. So, so maybe they're going to commission some beautiful buildings in the style of 500 or 700 years ago. And, uh, you know, that's great if that's, uh, that's what they want to do. Right. But, um, I'm more interested to see, uh, what, what people could do in terms of, you know, uh, rocket ships and exploring other planets and, um, you know, robotics and automation and, and that kind of thing. Okay, last question. Uh, yeah. Will will Bitcoin be a multi-planetary uh, currency one day? Is, is Bitcoin possible, ready for that when we have some uptips maybe? I mean, I'd, you know, I'd like to see that, right? But uh, some people have done done the analysis in terms of um, can you really mine across different different planets with the, with the delays of getting uh, the signal between there? You know, you're limited by the speed of light. So it might not be that easy to stay in sync with that. So maybe people could, uh, you know, could transact, but there there would be some, you know, element of uh, trust there, um, or or maybe you know once uh, once you have different planets that are populated, they'll, you know, they'll want some degree of independence. Maybe they will want to do something different. Mm. We'll, we'll find out. Oh, really cool. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And the end routine of the uh, podcast that is new, uh, like not new for the listeners, but <laughs> new uh, for you as a guest yeah. is uh, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about uh, besides Bitcoin? Uh, what can we learn from you? Um, well, I, I, you know, I've, I'm interested in a lot of different topics, right? So uh, I'm also happy to, to talk about AI actually going into some of the, the details on that. Uh, as well as uh, futures and options and derivatives and commodities markets. Um, so, you know, those are those are really interesting to me as well and happy to talk about those. Really, really cool. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask you questions and reach out to you? Um, well, I'm, I'm still on Twitter, which is still called Twitter, um, <laughs> at, <laughs> at uh, DKA218. Um, and, and from there, you know, I, you know, you can... Uh, I can provide links to 
to Noster or um, other forms of social media as needed. I'm, I'm on everything just because I want to communicate with a lot of different people and learn from a lot of different people. Really cool. Thank you so much for joining us today. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Bye. Perfect. All right. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah cool.